now I feel good. Warning, one minute warning. They are correct? Okay. Okay, let me get that, sir. Is there still a lot of people out in the hallway? Are there still a lot out there? Oh, you were, so you're pushing it, okay. Thank you. Okay, guys, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, hope you had a, a good lunch. I think we're gonna kick off a pretty exciting afternoon. I'm excited for the rest of the talks. I've been excited for all of the talks, uh, but I think we have a good, good closeout for the day. Uh, just one thing to mention, after uh, Scott and Kyle's presentation here, we're gonna have the, uh, the uh, solution sessions with iSight and Tanium and then WebRoot. The rooms are accurate as far as what's in the guide, so pick which one you want to attend and, and go to those rooms. So without further ado, take it, gentlemen. All right, welcome back from lunch. Hopefully you're not too asleep. You didn't go to too much of a coma. Um, before we get started, I want to make sure that we understand a little bit of who we're talking to. So for those of you who feel like it, you identify for, as coming from more of an Intel type of background, raise your hand. Just whatever that means to you. All right. If you feel like you come from an InfoSec or Incident Response or Unix Netbeard background, okay, so it's about evenly split. Would you say that's yeah? Okay, good. Little Intel heavy. Little Intel heavy, but you know we're in DC. Well, it's gonna happen. You know, okay. So what we're gonna talk about today is is really kind of focused between both ways, between both uh, uh, groups, as you were. I I was here last year, and really kind of spoke more to my fellow you know, InfoSec, uh, incident response types about the Intel analysis process. And this year it's a little bit more balanced between the two, I think. So we'll, so we'll introduce ourselves a little bit. Again, I'm Kyle Maxwell. Um, I am a, a sysadmin who got pulled into responding to incidents, who now suddenly finds myself doing threat intel and so forth um, at iDefense. Uh, I'm Scott Roberts. Uh, I work for a little uh, t-shirt and sticker company called GitHub. We do a little Git hosting on the side as well. And uh, I do incident response, threat intelligence, dig into whatever maliciousness there is. So Twitter is kind of the new Tinder for bromances. <laughs> <laughs> so S Scott and I met on Twitter somehow. I really don't remember how. Um, and we became good friends that years and years ago. And uh, we've been looking for an opportunity to you know, work together and do stuff together ever since. And today is kind of that opportunity. With that said, um, our good friend Alex Pinto presented yesterday. And he probably beats us in quantity of animated GIFs. But he also had a hashtag for his talk. And so we have a hashtag for our talk. So we need to beat him in the number of tweets using our hashtag. So if you're on the Twitter, I'm at Kyle Maxwell. He's at S. Roberts. Please feel free to tweet throughout the talk um, with the YOLO threat hashtag, um, which of course means you ought to look out, right? Um, with that said, also, please don't feel the need to hold your questions until the end. You can if you want to, but generally speaking, you know, feel, please feel free to be interactive, um, dynamic, ask us the questions. We will almost never say, hold that 
if we, you know, if it's going to be answered on the next slide, we might. But generally speaking, you know, we like to engage with it right then, mostly because you'll forget or will forget the question, and the moment will go by. With that said, I'll hand it over to my bro here, Scott, and let him go. So. Uh, I'm a, for all of you who raised your hands that you come out of the intelligence community, I'm super jealous, by the way. Um, I wanted to be a spy growing up. I watched way too much James Bond as a kid. Um, and so when this whole threat intelligence thing became a big deal, I thought, oh, good, it's my chance to be a computer nerd and a spy at the same time, which thankfully most people I know believe, which is great. So um, I ended up doing a lot of you know, introduction to intelligence stuff, and this is an intelligence-centric conference, so I thought I'd go over a little bit of the basics. Um, so we use a lot of words interchangeably that shouldn't be. Uh, data and intelligence are two, two big ones. Uh, data is a piece of information that you have that might be relevant to something you're working on. Intelligence is something that's gone through the intelligence process. Does everybody know the intelligence process? This thing, which when you say something's intelligence, you're going through this process, correct? But at some point when it comes to operations, you need to find a way to mix these two things together. How do you combine security operations, the DFIR stuff Kyle and I come from, and intelligence? And what we found has really worked in, in the past is this, this F3 EAD model. So is anybody familiar, F3 EAD? Some, some people can't say if you do know about it, that's fine. Um, <laughs> F3 EAD actually came out, I don't want to get overly military, in deference to Kyle. I appreciate that. Uh, a special forces methodology for, for kind of combining intelligence and operations at the same time, which is what Kyle and I are really about. So find, fix, and finish is the operations portion. Identify something bad you're going to go after, hunt it down, and come to a conclusion. And at the same time, you're conducting the intelligence portion of it, which is exploit the intelligence you have, analyze it to learn more, and share it with other people who are dealing with the same problem. And we're going to kind of, we, you know, this, this has been talked about by a lot of people. CrowdStrike's done a lot of work with, with F3AD. So we're going to pose it in a, a slightly different way. So uh, ours is all about hunting. And, and the, the talk is the most dangerous game. So we're going to talk about targeting. We're going to talk about the hunt. We're going to talk about the kill, not, not too euphemistically. And then we're going to talk about hunting stories. So if you're doing threat intelligence, the first question you really have to ask is, how are you targeting? Um, and for us, this means making a plan for collection. You've got to pick out who are the people that are interesting to know more about, who are the groups, and how do you define that? Um, w there are three big ways that I see. Um, you have groups that choose their hunting priorities based on actors, based on themselves as targets, and based on the technologies they have available, which kind of goes hand in hand. Um, the places you get that information, uh, there's a number. And, and one of the big ones that everybody's dealing with right now is feeds. Uh, who's consuming automated feeds? I'm actually surprised how few hands that is. Um, Feeds have become kind of a de facto for a, a lot of what is threat intelligence and becomes a great place to start picking who you're going to be looking for as far as your hunt. Um, some kind of no-name guy managed to make this point uh, about feeds. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be that harsh. But yes, it does. Okay, it, it does, does if you're Rick Holland. But, but feeds have... A lot of benefits, but also have some shortcomings, which can be volume and signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, a lot of people are talking right now about picking out who to hunt based on honeypots. Um, I'm, I'm going to keep doing this hand-raising thing, by the way, so enjoy. Uh, who's running honeypots right now for your, for your organization or personally? OK. Um, there's some great stuff you can get out of honeypots, but it, it's a, a really differentiated issue. Um, we have what we call low interaction honeypots, you know, your listeners on hosts that are just kind of taking in information passively, uh, which are easy to get information, but it tends to be low value. Um, you know, if you have a low interaction honeypot and you're literally researching every IP address that tries to SSH scan you, Christmas is coming and you're going to be busy until then. Uh, high inter uh, interaction honeypots are also a little bit more uh, information-centric, 
but they get really complicated. Has anybody tried running a, a massive uh, high interaction honeypot? It gets dangerous very quickly and it becomes tough to generate high quality, or it becomes a good way to generate high quality intelligence, but it comes at a lot of risks. Um, there's some great software out there for doing this. If, if it's something you're interested in, the HoneyNet project and uh, ThreatStream's Modern Honey Network has been uh, a really cool project that's come out in the last few months. So that's actor-centric. If you want to go to, to more of a target-centric approach, uh, you can base it on vulnerability information. But a lot of people tend to take that a little bit too far. And while structured vulnerability analysis uh, is not threat intelligence, it is really important. So vendors also are publishing an incredible amount of information about a number of different you know, technologies, actors, things like that. So um, I know Kyle and I have worked a lot on pulling information directly from some of those sources. Pi parsing IOX, that sort of thing. Parsing IOX. Um, this gets to one of my little asides, since I know there's a lot of vendors in the audience. Please stop making PDFs I can't cut, copy, and paste out of. And please stop, <laughs> and please stop putting IP addresses in like PNGs and graphic formats that I didn't have to like literally manually type in. <sighs> This, this, has, this has caused me a, a lot of effort. And so uh, you know, those are some of the lower, lower uh, fidelity ways that you can start going, who are the actors, who are the groups we need to be watching out for? But we've missed out on one of the most important ones. Did I, did I not leave that up long enough? <laughs> Come on. Give it a minute. In the end, we think that by far the most important way to generate who are the people you should be, who are the threats you should be most concerned with, where is the place that your hunt should begin, is this idea of reviewing your own incidents. Um, I know so many people who've spent an incredible amount of money on a big, fancy, shiny, vendor unnamed uh, incident management system and have never gone back and looked at any of their past incidents after the fact. And that's just beyond unacceptable and missing out on one of the best places to start your hunting experience. If you want to know who's after you, the people that you know are after you is a good place to start. The guy chasing you might be after you, in fact. Right. <laughs> and more than that, let's, let's take that a step further and maybe review the incidents for other people who are in your uh, sphere, your vertical. Uh, I wouldn't want to name any names, but if you have a target on your back, perhaps other people in that, that kind of vertical should be looking at what those people are dealing with. Is that too slow, too, too subtle? No, I think that was not too subtle. Okay, good. So with that said, so once you've determined what it is that you're looking for, and you still haven't found what it is you're looking for, now you start thinking about how you're gonna do it. Well, you start thinking first about sources of technical information. What am I going to analyze as part of what I'm doing? Well, um, I always mention, because I like to say it, um, my buddy uh, David Bianco, who's um, now at Squirrel, talks about the, get ready for it, the pyramid of pain, right? The pyramid of pain is really a simple concept, which is that the easier it is to gain some information, um, that's also the easiest information for the actor to be able to change. So, um, the easiest thing in the world to get are hashes, right? Those are everywhere. It's really easy for a, a threat actor to change their hash, but hey, it's a place to start, right? Here are some hashes or something that we know is bad. Okay, th this is, there are, it's something, right? What are some sources for this stuff? Well, virus share, of course, virus total. We're gonna mention them a few times today. Uh, Malware.com, which is a great site that needs to buy a vowel. <laughs> um, <laughs> But it's real. But the tech and, and the front end is really great. It's from the guys who do Cuckoo Sandbox and all of that. Um, once you have some interesting malware, perhaps somebody shared with you some hashes. You go and you can find a sample that matches that hash, right? And you will say, well, what am I going to do with this now? It's much. Okay, you can go scan your enterprise for that hash, and that's not really going to be that useful to you because somebody flips one bit and half of the average of the bits in the hash flip, and you're looking for something totally different. But you can get most of the value of reversing from some really simple stuff. Look, you may not have somebody who can spend 10 hours a day in IDA Pro and take this stuff 
apart. If you do, great. Those guys, those folks are really sharp at it. But maybe all you want is some basic C2 information. What does it call out to? Maybe you get a little bit of developer artifacts that are still in there. Somebody, you know, didn't strip debug symbols from their malware or, you know, something equally inane. Okay. You saw a black hat. They just leave comments in there, just plain text. Well, of course, I, I saw that Kaspersky says that you can attribute everything based on that. Okay. Okay. So. I was talking about a movie. Oh, fair enough. So, <laughs> passive DNS is, for me personally, the if, if there was only one tool I could use, passive DNS would be it. Um, passive DNS is really simple in concept. It is recording the DNS responses between servers that you see for later use. What resolves to what at what time? Okay. There are a number of different places to get it um, that have slightly different foci and how they and how they do it. Um, DNSDB from Farsight, uh, you know, they've got some folks here. Um, they have a really extensive, really broad database uh, from a bunch of different organizations that contribute in DNS data, right? And a long history of that data. So you can say, show me all the names that resolved this IP, and you're going to get a pretty good sense of the different names at different times that ever resolved that IP, or vice versa. Passive total is more collaborative. A lot of researchers kind of share data. They get different data feeds, and there's um, you know some tagging and some collaboration. So, for example, um, I love looking at that address and finding, oh, that's a sinkhole. That's why I'm seeing all this stuff here. Mm -hmm. And then virus total, of course, is going to be very malware focused. So every time they get a sample and they run it through their behavioral analysis and they do a DNS resolution, they record that. So then you go later on, look up a domain or an IP address, and they say, oh, that was associated and these days with this, these malware samples, for example. Super useful uh, in many, many ways when you're investigating infrastructure. Who is data? Um, the, the good folks at Domain, Totals, Domain Tools talked about this yesterday a little bit. Um, it's, it's, it's really easy to get current who is data. It's tough to get historical who is data, which is what you really want. I can't tell you how many actors have made, you know, we talked yesterday about OPSEC fail and OOPSEC with Ryan Krebs, right? How many actors originally registered their domain name with their real name and address? And they're like, oh crap, I need to put on a privacy guard. Well, great, but you know, we already can, can go look that up. Um, those sorts of things. You also want to do ongoing tracking. Okay, I know these actors like these TLDs. I want to track it over time. You can either keep doing the lookups every day, which is a pain, or you can use a tool like Hudat or, or one of those um, for doing your kind of ongoing tracking. Okay, so those are technical indicators, right? What about actor information? Well, this varies a little bit now when we talk about the type of actors, the type of adversaries that we're talking about. If you're talking about criminals, and in this particular context, hacktivist kind of falls under the same uh, rubric, um, honestly, your best weapon is Google. And for those who don't believe it, go ask Ross Ulbricht right now what he thinks about literally the way he was found initially was a Google search related right, to a domain name before a certain date. In other words, it wasn't just you know type in a search term, add a few operators, and bam, oh look, here's this guy with his real name starting up this site. What could that be? Um, tracking social media. Um, you know, Brian Krebs talked yesterday, again about this, right? All these guys have their Twitter and Facebook accounts, and you can get a lot of good information from that. And Facebook in particular, I've had great success um, with, oh, look, this guy, is, he, he's smart enough not to use his real name, but this is his girlfriend, and this is his mom, and this is his cousin across town. Now I know a lot more about him, and that triangulates very quickly. Um, Occasionally, you know, over the years, you hear people talk about tracking underground forums, right? Criminal forums, another area that Krebs investigates because this is the area where he's tracking actors, right? Um, those can be full of really great information. It also takes a lot more work, right, to be able to, to do this. So I would never recommend that somebody start here. This is where you get when you know the sorts of actors that you're looking for. You may even know some specific folks that you're looking for. And uh, you can have you know, somebody or a vendor or what have you focus on this stuff. This is high value, but also a lot of work to extract it. It's kind of like you know, cracking open like lobster or crawfish, right? The meat's really tasty, but it's a lot of work to get to that meat. I was really wondering where you were going with that. Food. 
Food. Makes you're, sense. you're the foodie. That's logical. Oh. Uh, and with that said, now Scott, who who thinks that he's James Bond in a hoodie. <laughs> I hear that's coming up in the next movie. Sweet. I thought that was the girl with the dragon tattoo anyway. <laughs> um, so, so my background more comes out of the espionage side of things, where tracking actors specifically can get uh, a little bit more complicated simply because they tend to have a little bit better opsec. So in our case, we find that most of your ability to track an actor is based on you know, the malware you actually find and reversing that, the, the things they do on a system, if you're lucky enough to get, you know, command shell usage, things like that. Sometimes who is registrar data can give away some. I believe the APT1 guys had uh, made some mistakes early on that. Uh, but the most important thing from, from that perspective is really the actions over target. Where I've been tracking groups of bad guys from an espionage side most effectively, it's more been who are they going after and what are they trying to get to and kind of correlating those actions over target versus mistakes they make at, at an ongoing basis because those groups are more likely to be deploying new pieces of malware, new exploits, things like that. Right, so as you're dealing with these different sort of actors, you kind of have to, in this sense, ascend that pyramid of pain, right? Because, you can't because you're not gonna track sophisticated actors just b via hashes, you need you need to track how they do, what they do, what they're targeting, you know, the things that are really at the pinnacle, the, the stuff that's the hardest and maybe impossible in some cases for them to change. Um, also is more work on our end as defenders, right, to track that. And with that, how do you keep tracking this information? Okay, this is great. I've pulled together some really useful information. Um, it's all in PDFs and it's all in my head and maybe in my, in my private Git repositories or what have you, right? Um, how do you track this? Okay, so threat libraries. Um, there are, you know, some open source solutions, right? Crits from the fine folks at MITRE, right? Um, MISP is another one that's a little bit more malware focused, but you know, kind of exists in the same area. Um, it, for some, in, for some shops, lighter solutions like literally wiki pages, right, with some wiki templates. Scott has that, used that, that in the past, that was right? Um, our go-to for a long time. Right, and for some things that works really well. There are a lot of vendors in this market. Some of them are here, you know, there's some that are doing good work and, and kind of iterating the space. You know, Threat Connect is here, you know, I've used their tool. Uh, you know, they're doing some good work, making good progress there. There are others that are kind of starting to address this, but there's a lot of room for growth and a lot of room because nobody, in, in ourselves included, right, even really understands what we want yet, much less how to build that, right? And so it's, you've got to kind of figure that out. Um, if you're tracking over time, as well, things on the internet. Uh, if anybody here has used Scumbler, anybody, has anybody heard of Scumbler? Has anybody heard of Netflix? <laughs> okay, so Netflix, prop to them, yeah, the one that, you know, is that I watch my Chromecast every night, um, released an open source tool that they use. It's kind of, if you will, a meta search engine. So, for example, I go set up a Google custom search. I set up several of them, actually. Um, I go give the API keys to my Scumbler instance, and then I tell it, I want you to keep watching for these things. So for example, I have a Google custom search for all the different paste sites I can find, mm -hmm. and I look for certain keywords, and it shows up in my Scumbler engine. Um, Recorded Future that just spoke before lunch, right? They do, you know, they're in kind of a similar, more or less area here. Obviously, it's a lot more refined than all the extra work that you would have to do in Scumbler. But regardless, you're gonna have to do at least some level of custom development because you're, you're focusing on whatever the targeting is that we talked about at the beginning, whether that's for your organization, your technologies, for specific threat actors that you're, that you're hunting, what have you. As well as how you want to integrate this data into other things. Do you want to use the hits you get off of a system like this to block things directly, to go into a SIM, to go into log management, to just send up somebody an email? Right, and, and, and that reminds me that you pointed that out because this works alongside another tool they have called Sketchy. There's a bunch of different tools that do it, um, Sketchy is the one that works best with Scumbler, but you can find others. And the idea is it takes screenshots of websites automatically. Not that you have to pull it up in your browser, but you feed this tool a list of URLs and it comes back and it says, here are the screenshots. This is great, for example, for evaluating possible phishing lure sites, mm -hmm. right? Um, so in that context, it does a, a great job for that. If you're looking for malware, um, VirusTotal is the king here. They're not the only player, but they are the, the biggest and baddest, and if you're not at least including them, you're missing so much stuff. 
Um, there are a lot of other malware feeds that you can go with custom internal development. Uh, there's open source stuff you can do. So Maltree, the tool, tool that I wrote, that uh, is basically a crawler for finding malware as it's being served today. You can feed that into Cuckoo for some automated dynamic analysis. Viper, from the same guy who, same folks who wrote Cuckoo, um, as sort of a malware storage thing. And then you may have, you know, different sorts of commercial things as well. As you're doing your hunting, you don't just want to hunt externally, right? So, um, as as Anton Juvakin and I talk about a lot together, log management is important. Log analysis it matters way more. Log management is to make your auditors happy. Log analysis is so you can do something with it, right? So you want to go look in your firewall logs, your IDS logs, your proxy logs for stuff related to what you're hunting. But don't just think about those things, right? Your perimeter network devices are important, but think about your web server logs, your mail server logs. Yeah, they're a pain to read send mail logs, but you, send mail is a pain in a lot of ways on its own. Um, DNS logs, oh my gosh, important, right? Authentication and audit. So, for example, anybody ever worked on a case where, and maybe you can't raise your hand, I understand, where OWA logs were super useful? If you haven't, you should go look at your OWA <laughs> logs because I guarantee there's something in there right now. For your VP output website. VPN. VPN logs, anything that's remote access, right? Um, with that said, the whole goal of this is to get to doing something. Gathering information is great and it's fun and it might even be a hobby as you sit at home at night because you don't want to raid in World of Warcraft anymore. You just like hunting this stuff. So the whole goal is to get to incident response. Well, what do we mean by that, right? The whole idea is not, I don't just mean reaction, right? There's also, because we're talking now about actively hunting down adversaries and not waiting for somebody to call you and say, um, I see a strange screenshot on all my desktops everywhere. Can you come look at it? Yeah. Right? You, want, you want to see Brian Krabs up here on speaking, not writing an article about your organization. Right. So um, the first thing, it, it could get confusing because sometimes as you find stuff, you don't want to let them know that you know, that they know, that <laughs> you know, that the, uh, it starts to feel like from the Princess Bride. But the other idea is that it's, uh, sometimes it's better to kind of spend some time and gather some more um, information to assess the full extent of what you're looking for, right? The full extent of what they've done. Now, the question always comes up, yeah, but who was it? I don't mean was it, you know, Hurricane Panda or wh whoever, right? Which, you know, legitimately, you want to have some level of, of understanding of who, but was it this specific, you know, what is the guy's name? Where does he or she live? Probably the specific who doesn't matter unless you can be this, right? If you can actually go after the actual individual with, you know, handguns and muscle cars and Ronald Reagan driving. I don't, I it's the, it's the license that. plate Liberty that you probably can't read. That's what's particularly great to me. Yeah, so Ronald Reagan in a, in a muscle car with a handgun through the windshield, not looking back at the explosions. It's great. Um, as Scott likes to say, this, is, this should be a, attributed to Scott instead of to me, is unless you can use handcuffs or cruise missiles on somebody, it probably doesn't matter their specific name and location. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah? Um, and as we said, sometimes it's better to spend some time just watching for a while and getting some information. The reason that some level of attribution does matter is so that you can say, okay, once we believe that this is linked to this particular threat group, what else do we know about them? Oh, we know that they also do this sort of activity, and we know that they also use this infrastructure. Well, now I have more stuff to go look for, whereas before, if you had cut it off immediately, before you understood anything about them, you haven't really accomplished anything because now they're just going to kind of you know, hide a little bit, a little bit more. Yes, Bertha. Scott, you want to take that? Sure. I mean, uh, the, the question was, where does attribution fit in with what a, a group is after? Um, in, in my experience, diff, I mean, groups have, are, are, very few groups are just compromising a network just to get a foothold and call it a day. Uh, there are groups, obviously, that do that, but it's rare. In most cases, there's an objective. And you may have four or five different groups attacking your organization, all with wildly different objectives. And so in, in many cases, we can see 
uh, a new piece of malware deployed in the environment, something we've never seen before, a new phishing lure, a new everything, and then we see them try to access the same person that we saw three campaigns ago. And at that point, you start to be able to identify changes in TTPs when they don't end up changing their goals. And so that becomes just one, one aspect of attribution. And that, to, and, to and Kyle, if I'm going to make you do it, the pyramid of pain. Pyramid of pain. Uh, it, it turns out that if a group's interested in stealing widget plans, they can't suddenly decide to change their malware, change their exploits, and change the fact they're after widget plans. That, that's just the toughest thing on the pyramid of pain to change for, for any actor. And, and once you do some level, okay, we believe it's these actors, you have an understanding of the sorts of things they might do and what you need to prepare for. The sorts of kids who are typically doing DDoS attacks, for example, may make a bunch of threats, but they're frequently, usually, don't have the capabilities to, say, drill into your credit card database, for example, or, or, or what have you. If, if the Syrian Electronic Army gets into your Twitter account versus Panda, whoever, they're going to have two wildly different goals as to what they want to do with that level of access. So to that point, right, um, we talk about intel-driven responses. So traditionally, right, in InfoSec, we think about deny. Pull the plug on the hack server, you know, add a firewall rule, um, take the server offline, reformat it, reinstall, and put it back on and never understand what really happened. That is certainly one way to do things. But you may want to think about other things to do. So eventually, you want to do a denial, right? Eventually, you do need to kick them out mm -hmm. and safeguard your infrastructure. But before, you may do things like feed them fake data and see what happens. Um, dis so not just deny, deceive, degrade, disrupt, and eventually. Well, you can't. I can't? You can't. Why not? But are you the military? <laughs> no. Are you the intelligence community? Definitely not. Then you really can't do that. OK, fair enough. So. Um, what I can do, hopefully, is where it's appropriate, where it makes sense, work with law enforcement, for example, and let them follow their, their process. And you know, if they can go give somebody a shiny new pair of handcuffs who deserves it, a shiny new pair of silver bracelets, great. Um, but you can, in the meantime, you can certainly try to deceive them. There's nothing that says, uh, hey, I see this connection. I see this account logging in. I'm going to feed them some fake data, direct them to some you know, to a honeypot or other fake infrastructure, um, try to, uh, any, if anybody remembers years ago the tool called Tarpit, right, that was just supposed to just slow down their connections and make them, you know, like Will Ferrell says, the best way you can get to know somebody is to see how they react to a slow internet connection. <laughs> and I really want to see that when it's my adversary who's like, why is this taking so long? Um, and eventually, of course, you know, disrupt, which is, you know, in, in Similar but not identical to deny, right? The idea being that you're trying to, you know, find ways to interfere somehow with their operation. Someone's FTP'd out 36 of 37 RAR files, and you cut off the last one mid-transfer. Or you give them a zip bomb that it's a, you know, 100k file that expands to four terabytes. Those are oh. those are great and interesting ideas. I don't know that I would ever seen anybody do that. That doesn't destroy any, anybody, right? It doesn't even destroy their infrastructure. It may, the, the, you know, fill up a hard drive. The point, the point with not talking about destroy is whenever you talk about active response, the first thing everyone wants to jump to is hack back. And the fact is, that's not really a legitimate answer for most organizations. Uh, and the few that it is a legitimate or, you know, option for are already know us. about it and are probably doing it already. And they're not, they're not taking advice from these that's nerds. That's probably true. <laughs> OK. The other thing that you can do is communicate with other folks, right? Who can make use of this information? There's two questions you've got to ask yourself. Who else needs to know about this, right? So, for example, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of folks probably here from financial services, financial institutions, right? You never see banks call each other out publicly about security, right? Well, you should come to that bank got robbed. The bank across town got robbed yesterday. You'd be much safer taking all your money out of that and coming to us, right? Because they have a vested and legitimate interest in the public trusting in the system, right? Believe that, okay, overall, banks are overall secure. So in general, financial institutions share threat information because they might be competing on, you know, interest rates and for underwriting a new IPO or whatever, but they're not competing in terms in, in, in these sense. Um, also, who might be able to provide additional information to me, right? 
So it might be a whole different organization. It might even be a competitor, right? It may be an organization that I have no relationship with, but I know that they're, they're involved. They may not even know they're involved yet, but hey, if I can work with them, then maybe we can share some, some logs or whatnot. So, so all that gets into this idea of hunting stories, which is how do you talk about these compromises you identify, these actors you identify, and all that, and, and discuss them after the fact. And so the, the two big breakdowns are the idea of products, and, and the next one we'll get to is audience. And so the, the big I, products we'll talk about are IOCs and RFIs, short-term products, uh, and then long-form products. And before you even get into that, the, the next thing you've got to consider is your audience. Uh, if you've ever written about an incident you've had, written about a threat actor, you have to treat things completely differently, whether you're talking to other members of your security team, peers who might understand what you're dealing with, uh, inside your organization, I think this is a really underserved topic in our community, of if you have a breach, what do you say to the people inside your own organization? Uh, because when you don't give them a message, you, they tend to make one up on their own, and that might not be what you're looking for. So one of the first ones is IOCs, and this has become a really important thing, and it, it's a really hard problem. How do you describe these wildly generalized large, large issues in a formulaic way that you can share between multiple people well, programmatically? I, Go ahead. I, I'm just, I just can't stop laughing. I think, I think you guys, that's all. And the, the two big pro products for talking about IOCs right now in a generalized way are obviously Styx and Open IOC. Um, I like both these projects. I like what they're trying to accomplish. I know they're both moving forward in good ways. Uh, but as a friend of mine put it, the XML issue is kind of hard to deal with. And I know that, that it's the sticks... down in the weeds, but it's, you know, there. Yeah, <laughs> preach on, right? The, the sticks team I know specifically is, is working to improve a lot of this. Uh, but but the, one of the tough things is whenever we get to talk about this, we just start getting frustrated and you go, I can't really stand the XML thing. And or anything else, something else about it bothers you. And, and the one thing I'll say is then we all start talking about, we should just write our own. We could totally do a better job. It would be great. I'm just going to go start a new repo on GitHub and write that, that, that. That's all, I mean, a repo is all it, t all it takes. takes. Right. So that being said, we <laughs> I at least personally support the products that are out there and want to see them improve because they are one of the best ways to share this information that can be used in multiple sources. From a more specialized level, uh, everybody writes snort sigs. Uh, and basically everything reads snort sigs, and from a network perspective, it, it's become a really great way to share this information. Uh, Yara is kind of a newer upcomer on the, specifically on the malware space, but has started to add all kinds of things. I think Moloch will let you use it for um, network flows. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Oh, I got you on that one. You did. I did not know that. I um, did not know that. <laughs> uh, volatility now supports it for memory objects, things like that. Um, and, and Yara is great because it gets you to use my company, which is even better. <laughs> well, it doesn't have to. Well, get polls. Um, so then you've got, you know, those are your ways of formatting this information you're going to be sending along. The, the, the easiest way to pass this information to other people is this idea of a, an RFI. So your boss comes to you and says, hey, um, I heard about this new group. Are they a problem for us? The RFI is a short, you know, couple sentence response that, that answers that email. Your tier three stock analyst says, what, what do we know about this specific, you know, set of domains? That, Let's find out some information about it. That, yeah, and, and these are things that should be short and turned around fairly quickly. Uh, for most people, what they'll eventually start working on is, is longer form, uh, short form products, which are, uh, you know, call it a page, a couple paragraphs discussing uh, information to support an incident response and the intelligence you've generated through there. Maybe a blog post. Maybe a blog post. Uh, for very few, but, but not nonetheless really important, are the longer form uh, products. These are going to be multiple pages encompassing all different types of intelligence. Um, is anybody not at a vendor generating these on a regular basis? Not at a um, oh. I, We should talk later. I'd be curious about that. Um, these are hard. These take a lot of effort, but they can be really useful, especially at a strategic level. And so we promised a surprise. Well, we, we, we've talked about doing a little bit of a surprise. And the fact is you, you only live once. You only live once. 
Kyle and I have been working on something uh, for, for a while, uh, and we've talked about it a lot and decided this seems like the best place to release what we've been working on. Uh, and so I, I always like to say you can't download a threat intelligence until now. Uh, welcome. Uh, we're starting uh, a company called Yellow Threat. Uh, you can go to our domain. Yes, it is a domain. .at is real. Um, we're just coming out of startup. I'm sorry. Okay, so um, apparently we're actually out of money. <laughs> so uh, we're going to be going back to our original jobs. <laughs> but. Uh, we have released some stuff on YOLO Threat, <laughs> um, a collection of Docker uh, images that will basically stand up a number of open source tools that are really useful for uh, an up and coming threat intelligence team getting started. So uh, we're going, there, there are. Uh, some we've created the Docker files our, ourselves, right? Maltrieve, Combine, you know, the tool that uh, Alex talked about yesterday um, that we released last year. Uh, some. We wrote a Docker file and then found somebody else had a better Docker file, and we said, well, why don't instead we focus on being kind of Docker librarians? Is that a longshoreman? Yeah, sure. Longshoreman? I don't know, the Docker containers, you know, the, sh the container oh. ship. I don't know, okay, that didn't work. Okay. Um, the idea being like, okay, somebody has done a really fantastic job of putting together an Elk Docker for Elasticsearch, well, no, what is it, Elasticsearch? Elasticsearch log stash Kibana. That, that thing. Um, Thug. For example, from uh, which is a kind of a um, honey client for web requests, right? Is a is a great tool, has tremendous dependency problems. Well, you know what? Let me back up for a second. How many people here know what Docker is? Wow, that's way more hands than I was expecting. Yeah. For the for the other seventy five percent that don't, right? Docker is. I'm going to overgeneralize here, and there's, there's probably some of them are like, no, 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 that's not accurate. It's close. It's a little bit more than a package, think like a, you know, like a .deb or RPM or MSI file, a little bit less than a full VM, okay? Um, and so you have this container that has just the, the information it needs to run an app and runs inside a container within, Docker in particular is fairly Linux specific. There mm -hmm. are other similar tools. Um, if you're a FreeBSD person and you know FreeBSD jails, Solaris zones, it's the same kind of thing. This is just Linux specific. So all you do really is you do a Docker pull, a a name like you know, uh, uh, Remnux slash Viper, and then you run it, and it's done all the stuff for you. Thug has so many difficult dependencies and special patches to apply that Lenny Zeltzer, you know, announced on a, a, a recent Sans webinar that he was releasing some of this stuff, which was great because I was like, oh man. Half the stuff I had started, I could just like rm-rf and use Lenny's instead. So thanks, man. So, so these are essentially useful recipes for getting these sometimes hard to get up and running pieces of software up and running really, really fast. So if your boss comes in on Thursday and says, hey, we really should have a threat intelligence capability by Monday, this might be a great place to start. So to, uh, to kind of summarize, did you have something else to say? YOLO. YOLO. Um, to, to summarize, um, you know, we talked about uh, how to identify the targets you're most interested in, some different processes for working through gathering information about them and kind of starting your incident response cycle, uh, intelligence specific uh, incident response, and then how to talk about things after the fact. And you know, we bombed a company. You know, everybody's got to have that one, right? It's like your starter startup. Right. Well, if you hadn't had that caramel macchiato this morning, we wouldn't have used up our $5 Starbucks gift card from Drake. Any so. additional questions? I love questions. Feel free to say, you know, I think you're wrong about this. Yes, sir. Speak up, I'll repeat the question. So this is gets to the, I, I, I refuse to use the term for the, that long Special Forces acronym. But the two three ead That one. So it's too mill speak for me. I'm a neckbeard. So you have these two parallel tracks, right? 
and they feed back and forth, right? So it shouldn't be you have a cycle, and then you hand information off to the incident responder, and then they come back with questions, right? They should run in parallel. So as the as the the hunter, the intel analyst, as you will, that the first one, you know, is aware of something to look for and tells the incident responder, hey, go look for this in the environment. And they have a collaborative process that's going forward as they they do the initial hunting. They the intel analyst is finding more external information or more sorts of uh, of things to look at. The incident responder is you know she's going off and and you know imaging systems or you know gripping through logs or or what have you, right? Wh how you split up between those two is going to be a little bit org dependent, right? So if you have an organization that is large and mature enough to actually have an internal threat intel team, right? That threat intel team might actually coexist with an incident response team and they're going to have one way of doing it. You might have an organization that has an external SOC and that external SOC has a third party third threat intel vendor that acts as their kind of tier four, tier three analyst for them. Um, and they're going to have a different one, right? Because the fact the organization here may only have one IR person and that IR person is also the firewall admin and VPN admin and, and all those things, right? So typically speaking, the way I would think of it myself is that the incident responder, and somebody you may or may not agree, the incident responder is the person that is most responsible for dealing with the infrastructure in an organization, right? The actual assets. The, you know, she's got the access to the systems, to the logs, to the network devices, what have you. Whereas the Intel analyst, you know, hopefully doesn't have a direct access to those things and is instead working with, you know, external feeds or just other data sources and trying to, you know, correlate that to what else is known about this. Is that how you would approach it? Yeah. I mean, I, I think what I've seen be most effective is teams that are co-locating threat intel and IR in, in the same place. Whether that be you, fusion. Fusion uh, analysts. Who had fusion and buzzword bingo? Um, I, 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 think, I think that where you can co-locate those things. So I, I mean, if you've been in a SOC environment, it's not unusual for somebody to be on a console and go, does anybody know anything about and, and, sh and just say an IP address? And it's so much more valuable if not only are other SOC people with the same access looking at that, but people with completely different access from an intelligence side are, are responding in the same way. And so co-locating those two skills might be a, a single DFIR analyst who also has a strong intelligence mindset, and it might also be a, a two specialized teams coexisting in the same area. What, what I think we're really just trying to get to in this whole presentation is CTI by itself doesn't affect anything. It generates reports. And IR without the intelligence to back it up can't respond to today's threats. Just and waits for, scre for bad screenshots on. Yeah. So, all your so it's really more about co locating those two things in whatever way makes most sense for your organization. Uh, actually, this is a selfish question. So, Yara on Flow, it's M O L O C H? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Moloch. Mo Moloch is a, a like full packet capture indexing in it. So let's say that you capture all the packets um, on your outside pipes, right? And you want to index that and be able to search that anytime because you're doing full network monitoring, you know, the, that whole uh, uh, network security monitoring mindset. Moloch is an open source tool to do that. And apparently, Yara can write tools, or can Yara can. So Yara is effectively a tool like Snort, but has historically been host focused. You say, okay, look for files that have these binary strings in there and match these different conditions, and you have some and ors and those sorts of things. You can do some Boolean logic within it. Um, Moloch is a whole separate tool. It's actually, believe it or not, from AOL. Um, you know, occasionally they do one thing right. No, sorry. My, I have my posters best friend, for the rest of my life with all those CDs. And my best friend got laid off from AOL last week, so I'm, I'm still hurting for him. So anyway, um, the the idea being that you know these are you know just two different tools. Yara itself is a kind of an open source way to write AV signatures, if you will. Th one of the ways that it's useful, by the way, is if you have the the subscription to VirusTotal, the four pay, the Virus Total Intelligence or whatever, you you can actually feed them Yara signatures and they'll alert you on any new sample that matches that Yara sig and then you can go download the sample and, and, and whatever and say, okay, I have a Yara sig, for example, let's say, that has um, uh, 
my company, you know, e any email that has my company's domain in it, right? Okay, you're gonna end up having to refine that, I guarantee, especially if you work for a company that does internet standards. But the idea being that then you can have a Yara SIG to then go look for those things and now let me go see, you know, what's happening that is related to, to that. Any other questions? Yeah, let's do one more question, if we've got one. It's a great opportunity. Don't lose out. Going once, going twice. YOLO! <laughs> so. right, guys, great job. All right, thanks. Thank you guys a lot. Uh, we're going to break out for the solution so solutions showcase, and that'll be the next hour. Then we have another uh, network break, and then we'll come back for a one-two punch uh, with the Lockheed guys and gal, guy and gal, uh, for some really good stuff that I'm thinking uh, we'll we'll get a lot of benefit.